Hi everyone, my name is ZJ and I'm a grad student at the Department of Biological Engineering here. So I work with Professor Timothy Liu at the Synthetic Biology Center as well as Neri here. So I would like to thank the organizers. This is an amazing opportunity for us to like brainstorm the future of biological wearables. So today I'm going to talk about how we can actually grow these materials from kombucha cultures. So I'm really happy I'm not the first speaker, so Rachel did an amazing job laying all the foundations, because oftentimes you need to convince people like why you need bugs in your materials. That's a phase. So since we are now all on board, living materials, they are very cool. They can sense and respond to environment. And this is due to like the huge advancement in the past two decades on synthetic biology, so we can actually program cells to sense, compute, record, and actuate, just like how you pr program computers. So there are a lot of living materials kind of work that was proposed in the past 10 years. So there are different design space you can operate in them from. So they, these are like the three most important dimensions, I think, personally. So you can have <coughs> micro scale materials like biofilms. And you can have macro scale materials like bricks and mycelium, like mushroom walls. Also, you can use di different design approaches. You can do a top down. So you predefine the forms, you 3D print it, you do casting, hydrogel devices, or you can do bottom up. So you encode that information in the genome of the microbes so they can do morphogenesis. And of course, uh, you can have artificial scaffold, like what we have seen before or you can have the microbes produce the material, like the matrix by themselves. So the work I'm going to talk about is like at this corner, where we use a bottom-up approach, everything's encoded in the DNA, and then it's at the macro scale, and it's a biologically fabricated matrix. So this work is in collaboration with the Ellis Lab at Imperial College London, because uh, one day they came to us, they said, hey, we found this really cool kombucha material and we isolated one bacteria from Czech Republic. That's really like amazing in producing a lot of cellulose. Mm -hmm. So we look into kombucha culture, we know this is like a hipster drink. It's very healthy for you. <laughs> As they say, me personally, I'm not going to make any scientific claims about that, but you can grow this in your kitchen and the kombucha mother is a very strong material. And potentially, they can live forever as long as you like transfer the mother into a new batch of tea and sugar. So, of course, a lot of artists, they have done amazing work using this kind of material. So apparently, you can make clothes, you can make one dressing, and you can make a lot of different devices out of this kind of bacterial cellulose materials. <coughs> So uh, we were looking at different kind of like naturally occurring living materials. The most ob obvious example is plants. So you see they can respond to light, they can have different like functionalization on different surfaces on a tree, leaves, and they can react into stimuli, so like chemicals or like some molecules in the gas. And also they have this symbiotic division of labor so most of the plants, they actually coexist with microbes and they perform different tasks. So we were thinking like, so in this kombucha thing, there are usually two members. You have bacteria that produces cellulose and you have yeast that, <coughs> you have yeast that produce like basically alcohol and provide food for the bacteria. So we were thinking this is like a pretty good analogy. So in a leaf, you can see like different kind of specialist cells. They, per they are like in charge of different tasks. But like in this cold culture we engineer, we can actually have the bacterium produce the material and have the yeast to be the computer that do the sensing and then compute and then provide an output. So this is the schematic. We are not going to engineer the bacterium for like the first reason. Biologic is messy and slow. We thought if we want to like achieve a level of have enough toolbox to engineer the bacterium, it would take about 10 years. So we look at the yeast. Luckily, yeast has been a major workforce in synthetic biology for decades. So there are a lot of things you can do with yeast. So to start with, you just mix the two microbes in the magical ratio, so they can coexist. And after three to five days, you can have this kind of like pretty thick material. This is a four-day culture. 
you can just like pull it up from the air liquid interface and then you have yeast cells embedded in it. So the first thing we were wondering like if we can actually make this like a catalytic material. So we can have the yeast which is commonly used to produce a lot of different enzymes. So we use uh, an enzyme that can convert a yellow substrate into a red product. And we fuse this enzyme, like anchor it, onto the cellulose matrix. And then we found like this material, when it's wet, they can convert the chemical into the red product. Even when they are dried out, they can still do this because you don't really need the cells to be alive once the enzymes are secreted. So there's a user, uh, use scenario where you can kill the cell and still make a functional material. So you can actually pretty much do like all the enzymes you can think of and functionalize this onto the cellulose matrix. So in this case, you can actually produce enzymes that can do blue pigments or like basically this is to show we can actually degrade uh, contaminants and other hazardous chemicals in the environment. And then we came into an issue because I don't know if you guys have seen kombucha culture, but like there's a sediment at the bottom. So basically the yeast, they are very heavy and dense. They tend to sink. So we thought like this is not really ideal because we want the computer to be in the material. So then we started to play with the density of the growth medium. So we kind of like increased the density and try to push the yeast up to the pellicle. So on the left, you can see before the engineering of the solution, you have all the yeast like loosely attached to the surface. But on the right, you can have like the entire yeast colony embedded in the cellulose matrix. So this is what it looks like on the surface. You have a lot of yeast cells in there. So once you bring the cell closer to the material, you can do more things. For example, in this case, we secrete enzymes that can break down different positions along the cellulose fibers. So you can actually tune the mechanical property of that material. So this is before producing the enzyme, this is after. So you can see this just become very loose and you can see all the cells still get trapped in the matrix. By using different enzymes, you can have uh, pellicles like this material with different stiffness. And these are just to show you can do different characterization to see there is a difference. And one funny thing about this, we try to make it stronger, but this is naturally super strong. So the only demonstration is to try to make it weaker and we try to convince people. Sometimes it's better to make it weaker. You can still make like different functional materials out of it. And of course, we want to do sensing. And in this case, we just use the pre-existing sensors that yeast have. So in this case, they can sense an environmental hormone, estrogen, and turn on the expression of green fluorescent protein. And what's interesting about this is like they are functional when they are uh, alive and wet you can actually store this up to four months. The yeast cell are still alive in the metro. You just have to reactivate it in the growth medium. And also you can swap out the output from the GFP, which is not very useful, into some enzymes that can actually do bioremediation. So they can sense contaminants, they can remove the contaminant. And then the final demonstration, we thought it would be really cool if we can actually do like optogenetics, that is use light as an input and use the bacteria, uh, use the yeast, sorry, to produce an output. So we engineer an optical circuit so they can actually sense blue light and then produce an enzyme that produces bioluminescence. So this is a mandatory school logo photo, which is very common outside Media Lab. So you can see by using different engineering, like we have different E strings, we can have different resolutions. And we can tune the resolution by control the growth rate of the yeast. Or like on the right, you can let it grow for a longer time, you have a better resolution. So those are the things we have done. So what we are thinking is like this is a 2D material kind of thing. What we want is volume. We want a lot of volume. So we turn to YouTube for inspirations. <laughs> this is a small scale one. I believe a lot of people seem like they can actually do this in a much larger scale. So some of them in this YouTube videos, they actually use yeast as the catalyst. So there's an enzyme called catalase in yeast that can convert peroxide into oxygen. 
and it's a miracle in nature. This is like the best, like most efficient enzyme you can use. So in this video, they use like a chemical as a catalyst, but if you use yeast, you can kind of have the same effect. So we were thinking, this is what we've been trying to do right now. It's like if you can actually start with very little volume of liquid, and then you can like just add uh, peroxide, and you can have about 100 times increasing volume. And we are also like doing direct evolution. So what we think would be really useful is now you can have a living material that's actually, you can do evolution on the material properties. So for example, like here you have the density of the cell, you can make it magnetic, you can make it more adhesive. And this is a, another demonstration, like they can actually take up the metal ions. So if you engineer metal binding protein into the yeast, it's basically like a plug and play system because there are just so many things you can do with the lab strand of yeast. So you see this environmental SEN image, the black dots, meaning like they've been taken up metal ions. And also you can produce a lot of different kind of antimicrobials uh, anti to kill pathogens. Because we know like bacterial cellulose is actually like one of the most popular wound dressing materials. So if you can actually incorporate active ingredients into it, that would be pretty cool. Besides killing microbes, what we are trying to do now is like they can actually provide a lot of growth factors to direct the uh, differentiation of stem cells or like immune cells. What would be really cool to me, like we've seen like a problem before is about like yeast cells being really dense this would not be the problem in this space. So if we can actually provide them like a new, gra uh, a low gravity environment, they can form like a solid phase, very homogeneous distribution, kind of like living material. So yeast has been used for devices for point of care, like point of detection, because they can actually provide a lot of medical relevant molecules that are human use. So we're thinking like maybe this is an opportunity. We should really look into that. And with that, I would like to thank a lot of people I work together in this work specifically, people at Imperial and also Brendan here and uh, the George Sun at the Belcher Lab. Thank you. <laughs>